Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I am the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival and to our discussion about the viewing booth. I want to thank the Dockyard, who is our community partner on this screening, and particularly Abby Sun. Um, and also thank you to the filmmaker of the viewing booth, Ryan Ann Alexandrowitz, for being here with us and a very special guest um, who all of you will recognize from the film, Maya Levy, for being here as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So there is a lot to talk about in this film. Um, and I have, I'm sure the audience will have many questions too, but let's start at the beginning. Um, you open the film with a quote from Virginia Woolf. Um, I'm curious if you had seen that quote before you started making the film or if you saw it and sort of reflected back and how you sort of took that uh, quote to fit into uh, your goals in making this film. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, how, it's a little bit like a filmmaker's question because you know that things, uh, how things uh, develop in the process or in, in retrospect, but actually, I've been um, part of, so I, I had, the quote was really what, the quote was really, a, uh, me getting to know that quote is the moment where this project was somehow conceived. I have been, I was already in the process of trying to understand if there is a way for me to um, think about the viewers and not only about images. Um, I mean, maybe I should back up a little bit and say that th this whole project is a, a little somehow a result or, or comes out of an earlier film that I also showed at the Boston Jewish Film Festival, um, The Law in These Parts, which, um, uh, which was a film that, that explored the quote unquote legal injustice mechanism of the, of the occupation. And that film had it was received quite strongly um, when it came out, and was for a documentary film. It sort of it was hitting on all the right cues to make me feel that I'd done like I'd, I'd achieved what I wanted to. The film was traveling; people were seeing it. I, I had a lot of screenings in Israel with teachers and with um, people, who, um, you know, legal departments of governmental um, legal offices, and so on. So I really felt what I, what you want to feel when you make a film that um, is supposed to have some impact um, in politically or in terms of social justice and so on. But after a while, I started having doubts. Um, I, I started having doubts both about what that film was achieving, but it also expanded and I started having, I started having this sort of crisis about um, what non what the nonfiction image was or wasn't achieving in terms of its, like, it, the, the, the role that we always give it in terms of, you know, making a better world. Um, and I started going in different directions with that, not really knowing that I would make a film yet, but, but at a certain point, and this is when this quote comes in, at a certain point, I, I actually read uh, Susan Sontag's re regarding the pain of others, which starts with this quote. I didn't read the original Wolf at first. Um, and and it was then that I understood that I really have to try to find a way to look into what viewers do with these images, rather than think about images and how we make them and what we try and achieve or not achieve, but really. And so this was really how the, the project sort of began, but it would, it would still take, this is still two or three years before, or two years before Maya and I have this session at Temple, because I had when I was looking for it, I tried different approaches with different visual materials and different situations and different people. And in a way, what, what happened that started this film was one of these etudes, exercises that I did towards the goal of capturing something about the viewership of the images of pain of others. And so that's, that's how it began. Maya, what were you expecting when you walked into that room? And I, and I have to say, it's, it's really interesting to be seeing you on a Zoom screen because it's so, familiar. Um, the angle is quite similar to the one that we see throughout the film. Um, but, but what were you, what were you expecting when you walked into Ranan's booth? Um, 
So it's funny that you say that. Now I know the second time, actually the second time, like um, when I came in for the second part of the movie, like that was actually, I think the first time I've ever seen myself on a screen. Um, so it's like funny that you're saying that it's like natural. <laughs> because now it's so natural. Half a year yes. later, we all are in viewing booths. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. We're in our own viewing booths. Um, so what was I expecting? I had no idea actually what I was expecting. Um, it was, I, I didn't even know really who Renan was. We just had like a five minute conversation before. The person who um, told me about um, Ranan and this whole project that he was doing um, didn't really tell me what was going on. So I actually had like no expectations. I knew something to do with Palestinian, you know, Israeli conflict, but I just kind of walked in just thinking like, I don't know. I mean, I really had no expectations. Why did you agree to this? Um, it's, it's very intimate, so. So I had a, I have a friend who did it and they were basically like, Ranan was looking for students. Uh, I think it was, is, was it Jewish American students that you were looking for? Yeah, I mean, just to, Maya really didn't answer the open call that I, I think that's maybe the missing detail. Maya didn't respond to the call because she probably hasn't seen it and someone told her about it. And then she, she texted us or they texted us while we were mid, we were in the middle of filming and someone else had canceled. Uh, mm -hmm. So we told, so we texted back to Maya, we have time at 8 p.m. if you can make it. And that's how, I mean, Maya, and the film became Maya. <laughs> yeah, I really wasn't even supposed to come. Like my friend was like, go, oh, they'll give you like, what was it like $30? Like, come on, do it, whatever. I was like, all right, I guess I'll just like get gas money or something. <laughs> and then like, I just came in and then this whole thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very curious about who you cut from the film. We do see them at the very beginning. Um, you said, you know, obviously, Maya, you talk about why why you chose to include her. Why didn't you choose to include include the other students? So when I when I finish, and as I said, also you can see both from, you know, from how the if if you study the film closely. And also its credits, you'll see that this was made with very, very limited resources. And in fact, when we were doing, when I was um, filming the session, I did not think that it would necessarily become a film um, because it really, and it really wasn't planned out further, but it was the title that I gave this, um, this, ses this session at Temple was The Meaning. I said, these are images that I know their meaning, they're very meaningful for me. And now let's see how people who are people that I'm interested in as audience for my film, let's see what meaning they give um, these images. And the, again, Maya didn't come because of the call, but the call was the language of the call and the way that I, that I, we, we put it out at Temple was it was meant to reach Jewish audiences. It was meant to, it was, you know, it was the question up there was something like, um, are you are you interested in Israel? Do you watch online videos? We are um, having a film viewing of, of online material. So obviously, for instance, if you are, if you're a pro-Palestinian activist at Temple, are you interested in Israel is not, and I'm very aware of these things. So obviously this is not the way to to ask, uh, for instance, pro-Palestine activists to, to invite them, right? So it was kind of, um, um, you know, skewed in that direction because I always felt like when I was making films about Palestine, about um, Israel, I always felt that while Israeli audience was my primary audience, um, American audience, and especially Jewish American audience was a very important audience. And so, um, now, when the filming was over, I started editing comparatively. I would take a video and then put in a few, um, a few, uh, you know, different responses and start editing it that way. And it, it was interesting, but going over the full recording that I had with Maya from that session, which was about an hour and 40 minutes, um, I felt that, I mean, Maya was... First of all, she was 
furthest from me politically from from everyone who was there but she was also the most engaged with the images i mean the fact that she had this kind of negotiation with these images which made them which made her it was it was very different from the way i see those images but it was kind of as important for her and that, that's why i really began to feel that she is the yeah this is really like an opportunity to meet someone who is really the audience that i would have looked for for other films that i made and and still um, I, I felt there was a heart of a film there, but I didn't know how it would continue. So it really took a few months until this idea of, okay, let's ask her to come back and view at herself viewing and see what comes out of that. It was only, um, uh, it, took, it took a while to, to come to this idea. It, 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 you sort of ask us to do that too, to look, to examine the way we watch by putting the camera at the beginning and end of the film. and. We don't see you in the film, but we hear you. And I'm, I'm curious what it was like for you. There are moments in which, even though we're watching Maya, your point of view is, is clear in the film. Even in the way you sort of frame the footage from the very beginning, half of the footage is from a human rights organization, half of it is from a more conservative organization. Or um, the choices of where you, you know, what you, where you get frustrated with Maya even. Um, what was it like for you to sort of watch yourself reacting to Maya? Um, and how did you think about how that played into the film? Yeah, um, I mean, that was a big... I think Maya knows by now that um, because we've, we've talked about it a few times like this in these kinds of conversations, um, that it was difficult. It was difficult for me. I was afraid that this film would be a betrayal um, of a betrayal of the images of these images that I I feel are very important. That because it is not my role to say what I think about the images, but it's my role to listen to Maya mostly. I um, mean, it's true that in the second part of the film, I I I I say a little more, but still I'm very reserved and I. Finally, if you analyze the text of the film, the interpretation that these images get are Maya's interpretation. I was very worried about that personally because of my 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 because of my po politics and my um, uh, commitment to you know to to B'Tselem. To not, I, I mean, I don't have any formal contact with B'Tselem, but I'm committed to their idea. I'm committed to what they're doing. I'm committed to the truth of these videos and. So, uh, but I did, but it was clear to me that it's not my job here to, we are looking at something else. And you're very, I, I, I love it that you say that the film is about all of us and not about Maya's looking. And in fact, the Hebrew title is Mara, which is mirror. Um, and I feel that what also made Maya um, so, you know, why, why the film is her is because she, you know, without moving away from what she believes, she, but by being very authentic about it and very, you know, reflexive about it and being able to play all those roles, she did something that I, I'm not sure many people could do and become a mirror for people who are very different from her. And I think she experienced it when we went to Doc Aviv. I told her before, you know, we're going to screen this like really at, you know, at the heart of the left. Um, in Israel, and and it's going to. It might be very hard. It might be hard for you. It might be hard for me. I don't know how reactions will be. And, and she asked, my asked, I don't know if she, asked, she asked. I mean, it'll be civil, right? It won't be violent. <laughs> so, no, I'm, I'm I'm not. But it can be unpleasant. But it was interesting to see how people lined up after the screening to talk to her because there's something. I mean, it's a film about the breakdown of communication. Um, that in a way becomes a form of a dialogue. And I think people had an interest in that. Um, very, and not real, re maybe not, a, you know, you can question if it's a dialogue or not, but it, it definitely opens a, opens a door to see if there is areas that we can understand, that, that we can agree on, which is even if it's just that, can we agree on how 
difficult it is for us to see. Um, yeah. Well, I think I think there's certainly we see Maya having a dialogue with herself or with yourself, I should say, since you're here, we see you having a dialogue with yourself and sort of feeling out these different ideas. And I thought it was really interesting when you return to the booth, how you start to question Ranad and you say, you're sh you're showing me walking out the in the door. I've never seen myself from that angle. Um, and it almost is, is as though you've started to look at all video differently. Have you found yourself watching all media or sort of looking at documentaries differently um, since doing this or film or experiment or whatever whatever um, term you want to use there? Um, I, I think definitely. I mean, I think it almost kind of ruined it for me because now when I watch Netflix, like I just have it in my head that like there's just a camera guy like right there. You know what I mean? Like right next to the person who is acting or whatever. So um, I, I think I definitely look at everything. I mean, and obviously I knew that every, I knew that before, but it was never so like obvious. Um, I definitely also look at, you know, documentaries, um, you know, anything that that's based on truth or, you know, like something that's supposed to be even something that's alive um is is really manipulated and altered depending on what the cameraman is choosing to show us and and what he isn't you know what i mean like even a live concert can look very different if you're there or if you're you know um watching from a screen because you're real the, the cameraman is really choosing like when to zoom in on a certain person or when to zoom in on the crowd um and i think that it even applies so much more today since everything is almost virtual right now. So now cameramen have a lot of control over what we're watching and yeah. Yeah, um, there's some great questions coming in from the audience, but I'm also curious to know from you, Ron, on how working on this film has changed your filmmaking because you say that Ma at the beginning, you said Maya is, when you met Maya, you realized she was your sort of ideal viewer um, and that you go into documentary filmmaking with the hope of changing someone's point of view. And of course, at the end of the film, Maya says, I think Bethlehem is helping me. Um, so in some ways the footage did, did the opposite maybe from, um, from what the intention had been and you showing it to her. Um, has this changed your approach to filmmaking at all? Um. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's so, um, it, there's something difficult about Maya and I having to really, Maya and I, um, so there are things that I never asked Maya, like afterwards, um, how she, if, if, uh, if these images really, I mean, this was what, in the filming, this was what happened. Um, And, and and maybe I'll start by just addressing your question and say the reason I made this film is because I am going through some sort of change and and I'm questioning and I'm I feel that there I mean there's the documentary environment now the nonfiction environment is so wide and there's so many things and strong things from videos to huge films and really where I can find myself now is where I can find myself useful at this point is really in trying to explore the connect the, the relationship between people and all these images because i don't really know what else there is for me to do that's useful and that other people are not doing maybe better but in terms of so for, with each with each film i mean I, I imagine there are some filmmakers in the in the audience with each film I guess all filmmakers create some rules for themselves, how they work on this specific film. And one of my rule, one of the rules that I have for myself is that the dialogue that Maya and I have is more or less what was, what was recorded. Like she said, she came, we met for five minutes be before the first shoot. I think I walked, uh, it was maybe, I don't know. I think I walked with her to her car after the second shoot. So we had a little more dialogue. 
And then she came three times to see Rough Cuts, but we always spoke about the film. It was really the first time um, before we went to Dokaviv was the first time that we really had some sort of exchange that was outside this you know, dialogue within the booth. And I've never asked uh, Maya this question, if in retrospect, these images really, if it remains there, that these images, I mean, if she's the same place with these images that she was a year um, and a half ago when we filmed it, and I, I'm not gonna ask now, <laughs> but, I can, but I can say that an interesting thing happened when I went to show the film to the people who filmed the videos, the Palestinians who filmed the videos that are in the film, when I, the film was close to coming to an end, I went to Hebron and I had a meeting with them and I was really anxious about that too, because I, was, I, I, don't, I didn't know what I would do if they would have said, wow, you made this film that allows someone to come and hack our work and just say that, you know, what we're doing is worth nothing. And these are really people who are documenting their lives. Um, and and, um, and uh, it was interesting, it was an interesting um, situation because they were watching the film on a laptop. The film didn't have Arabic subtitles yet. So someone was translating for them. And I was sitting on the other side watching their faces as they were watching. So it's kind of the viewing book, the, the sequel. And, uh, and it was interesting because Maya's doubts, they, that, that wasn't, they, they said this we know, it's our daily bread. Like every day someone asks us, why are you, why are, we, why are you here with the camera? What are you doing here? I mean, did you, did you direct this? Did you create this? Is this real? I mean, but, they, but he said, yeah, yeah, they said, yeah, we know that, but look how she's looking. Like, look mm -hmm. how, look at how she engaged she is with this. I mean, they said, we're, we're sure that she, she's gonna be on our side one day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but this is again, this is like out of the dialogue between, so maybe you can <laughs> ask Maya. Well, Ariana, maybe sure, you can ask sure, Maya. Maya. <laughs> In watching the, maybe in watching for yourself, watching for the, watching yourself, watching yourself, in in watching the film, um, and and I guess subsequently, has anything changed for you? You're muted. Am I still? Am I? Can you hear You're me? Good. Okay. Um. So did I? <laughs> <laughs> if you uh, want to answer no 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 it's okay so I, i'm um so has anything like changed like i'm not like i wouldn't say i'm like a different wing politically i definitely am more aware though like would you say something like these people are documenting their lives like when you just said that like a kind of is it, it, it's it's a true fact I mean, they are documenting their lives. Um, and as you saw in, in the film, um, it wasn't totally without any, um, I guess, feeling towards them. So it was, it was painful for me to see these things. So I definitely, and I think that's what's like pretty amazing about what people don't realize about, you know, politics or whatever, like you can be on one side or, uh, you can claim to be on one side, but still really be in the end for the people, like whatever that means, whatever side that means, like, you know what I mean? Like people are hurting. Are they Palestinian? Are they Jewish? Are they whatever? Like, it doesn't really matter. Like people are suffering. Um, so I definitely think that it, it opened my eyes to human suffering as a whole and what we can do, you know, in the world to, to like, you know, bring awareness to that. I don't know if, if I'm, again, like I said, like on a, on a different, a different side politically, um, I definitely still have the same, the same views that I did, but it definitely did open my eyes again to the conditions that, um, that the Palestinians are in. And uh, yeah, I mean, and how their daily lives are, how they're operating, you know? I, I think there's something 
that ties really nicely from what you say about sort of opening yourself up, um, see, seeing the images in the humanity and also their response that look how deeply she's looking. Um, and I think it's, it's, we see so many images today on a scroll and, and maybe don't spend time deeply looking. And I think that sort of ties to one of the questions from our audience, from Irina, um, who says the film suggests that unfortunately film and video really can't be much of a force for change. And, and I'll let you speak to that a little, but certainly also the case for video of Rodney King so long ago. Um, what for some viewers is oppression, for others is exaggerated and political rhetoric. Um, part of the question was, how has the film affected you, which you spoke a little bit about, but do you still have faith and hope in images and documentary filmmaking as a force for change? Yeah, so that's a great question. And maybe I should also say that I don't think that if, it, if, if it's implied maybe from this uh, conversation or from the film that I think that the only role documentary has is to represent social justice and human rights issues or create political change. It's not what I think, like nonfiction. The nonfiction image has, has many roles. Um, this is one of them. And this is the one that I have gotten. I, I f this is what I felt that I should do with films because of where I come from and who I am and and because of my biography, but also the, the generation that I'm from and, and my age um, is, so, you know, I think I had a huge, I have a huge belief in images and I'm also, I grew up in a era where there was scarcity of images. Like you just mentioned Ariana that images on a scroll and we don't even, you know, we don't even what to know what to stop and look at. And we get into the habit of not looking, but in, in conversations that I've had around the film, I tell that it was really when I was growing up, it was when something came, you would, and you would really want to engage with it because there was so little. Um, and not only there was so little, but it was not in your control. It came on the news and went away. And uh, it was like a fleeting thing and you had some memory of it and people were arguing about images that they couldn't just replay and ask. So put all this aside, really the 20th century is, is a time where images did huge things for humanity. They also did some negative things, depends on how they were used. Um, but, but Really, I come from a world where to say a picture is worth a thousand words or photography is truth is not, a, wasn't a, an ironic um, statement. And, and we are now, but we do have to acknowledge that the, the nonfiction environment has changed radically in the last two or three decades, mostly the last two. And our belief in images and our par paradigms of how to work with images have to be re-examined. Because, uh, be, because the things have changed. I, I'll, I'll quote, I, I, I've quoted a few times a sentence from another film, very different film that I've seen this year that I liked a lot. It's an Argentinian film called The F Faculties. And it's a film about students um, studying in university in Argentina, but there is a piece there that's relevant to what I'm talking about. Uh, it's filmed in an economics class um, let, let's say a year or two ago, and the professor says to the students, the, the, the financial crisis that we had here 20 years ago, this crash didn't change one letter of how economics is studied in this, in, in this faculty, um, in this department. So it's a little bit like that. We are, I'm trying to understand what is the nonfiction environment that we are living in and if there's a way to move beyond the inherent disbelief and the inherent not looking that we are in now. And I don't have any answers, but I definitely believe in the power of images. I, I feel that it's a, an important resource, a young and, 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 and fragile resource that humanity has, and we should try to take care not to lose this resource. I think this film does some of the work of sort of finding the place between seeing is believing and question everything you see. Um, 
I mean, I think we see it in, in Maya and we see it in your engagement with her. There's another question here from someone who's anonymous. Um, when you were trying to figure out the right model for doing this experiment, did you consult with any professionals like psychologists? Yeah, no, um, but also experiment. I mean, the only, I use the word experiment in the film to say that I said it's not an experiment because it really, it, it, this didn't create any data. It's not controlled. I did make a choice after trying, I, I mentioned that I did many kinds of like etudes or exercises towards this. So I filmed in people's homes. I filmed in, in cinema. So I feel, I tried to find the right form to do this kind of thing. And finally, I felt that whenever I was trying to go into a, an environment that was seemingly natural, there it was really fake. It was fake because this thing is so constructed that when you had the image of someone sitting on the sofa with their, you know, with their family and looking and responding, there was something that I felt was really fake. So I said, actually, I should try to do this very, um, I should try to expose the, 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 the constructedness of it. And then, yes, there is a tradition of, of, uh, viewership studies where people were put into all kinds of machines and you know a neuroscientist study people watching films and so on so maybe the, the the design of the film the visual design of it is a little bit like a reference to that but it's really not an experiment um and no i i sort of worked with the tools the documentary um gives us which is you know to, to try to look at things to try to have empathy for, for with whoever is in front of you and create connection from that. Um, maybe if I would have consulted with psychologists, it's always the question when you, when you make a film, like, do you want to be fully aware of the professional aspects of the world that you're getting into? It would have been good on one hand, but then it might also sort of have limited me in other ways. So, but I did not do that. It's interesting to hear you talk about sort of not deciding to use these artificial real settings and and then of course the title of your film is the viewing booth and i think so much of of what came out of it um appears to be dependent on the the space itself by can you talk a little bit about how you felt in that space were you cognizant of ranan watching you and listening to you did you get more comfortable over the course of that hour um so yeah so i I think maybe I occasionally looked at the window, like to my right, um, that ran on. I don't know if I looked so much. I was actually pretty like into it. It's like a all encompassing type of feeling. Like it's really hot in the booth. Just, just <laughs> why I was like really hot. I was like sweating um, and I had this little earbud in and that's it. Just sitting there, me, the chair and the screen. Um, it was, so it was definitely kind of like, um, was almost in my own world, you know, just like in the, in the, in the movies, I mean, in the clips that were being shown to me. Um, and I don't think I was like, I don't, th I don't think I was so engaged with what was happening like outside. I know there was a film, you know, like uh, Zach Reese was filming the cinematographer and um, they're, you know, like they were moving the camera all the time and run on and whatever. So no, I don't think I was super aware of it though. I was kind of just like into, you know, what I was, what I was watching. I, it, the film sort of starts with you asking Maya if she's comfortable and, and I imagine you got increasingly uncomfortable watching the footage. So I'm glad at least the chair was cozy. <laughs> yes. I should, just, I should just say that um, this booth is not something that was constructed for the film. Okay. It was just once, once I started looking for spaces and I I knew I wanted to do something constructed I found that there is this um, it's a whisper booth it's just to record audio um, for post-production and so suddenly okay so that we had the space so we started to work with it and yes it's not air conditioned inside so that was difficult but I have to say that we, we all the time asked Maya do you need you know do you want to do you need a break do you and Maya was like, no, no, no problem. I'm, I'm with it. And at times we were really worried about, because it's actually not an hour, it's more. Um, 
It's uh, the first session was an hour and 40 minutes. Um, and I think she did it without a break. Yeah, I think we, we never, we didn't even stop the camera and we hoped that we won't lose the file because it was getting so big because she just sort of went through it like that. Um, yeah. Wow. I, um, there, there are a few questions that we don't have that much time. So I do want to make sure that um, we get to the audience questions. Uh, there's a comment here. Thank you for such an amazing film from Mary in a time in which fake news has been thrown around for a long time. Thank you to Ranan for positing the question of viewership and how that works. And thank you to Maya for your honesty as a viewer. Um, there's a question we talked a little bit at the beginning about um, using the camera at the beginning and end of the film. And uh, there's a question from Jeff Katz. It says it's very reminiscent of medium cool. I'm wondering since medium cool is a blend of fact and fiction, if it informed your film. I have to admit, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I, I think I know what it is. Um, who made it? Um, a cinematographer, I think. Well, we have to ask the your audience member. Jeff Katz. Um, I think I, oh, yes, yes Haskell, Haskell Wexler. Wexler. Yes. Yeah, you, you exposed me. <laughs> well, now you'll have to watch yeah. it and, and see. You'll have an that answer and, for the next and, time about how it influenced yeah. you. <laughs> that and, other, and 500 other films, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a question here. The film really opened my, my, my own eyes to how I would view an image, either nonfiction or even fiction. This is a question for Ranan with Maya's input would be great too. How much responsibility do you think is on the filmmaker to interpret an image and how about the viewer? And I think this is also an interesting question because you have now have this relationship with each other um, and you're coming at such different places as viewer and filmmaker. Um, so who's who's responsible for interpreting an image? That's, you know, that's, that's a million dollar question because <laughs> the, the makers of images take the responsibility um, upon themselves, as, you know. But I think that the, the difficult thing to deal with is that we don't have, we, we can't, um, always have it our way. We know what we want people to, to get from images that we create or even images that we um, mediate, if, even if it's our own image, but people won't necessarily go there. And I think this is something that is not very much discussed because it's such a, a dark, it's like the dark side of make, creating media. And it's so dark that we rather not think about it because then we would just lose. I mean, our, the whole job of, of making a film is assuming viewers all the time. Every decision, like thousands of decisions, every cut, every every cut, you, this, you, you, you assume that people have come to the place where they should be with the shot and you cut to the next one. So you operate with this belief that you can you know, you can assume what it is to be the seer of the image, the, the, the person who sees this image. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, now it's true. And I think also Maya, I think I also heard this from Maya at some point that when a work is narrated, um, then you do have sometimes you do sort of gain control of viewer by use of narration tool. It can be music, it can be narration. I've, the, the work that I've done before was much more heavily narrated. This is like the film, from the films that I've made, this is the one that I left most open. And, and a lot of people just, you know, just you know, un, don't see it as a film or say, I, I don't even know what to do with this because there's not a lot of leading. What do you want from me? What do you want from this? So in films, we do have tools to sort of take the audience with us and, and show them how they're supposed to feel. But ultimately, I think it comes to the same place as non-narrated media. It comes to the same place where viewers who have, who really need to negotiate this image will. 
with all with all your tools and 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 they will actually use so this is an experience that i had um and it will be difficult to explain but i've learned that people who are opposed politically to what is said in my films will attack the form they're not going to say i don't agree with what you want to say or uh, they will say this is not you know, this is edited, this is manipulated, you chose this, you did that. Um, this is really the way we're, this is how people will push against my work. So, so narration is kind of like a, a, a double-edged sword. You can lead people through the process that you want, but you also give them the tool to undermine your work and say, um, this is, you know, I don't have to look at this. So it's both the stories that the filmmaker is telling us and then the stories we're telling ourselves to sort of understand it and fit it into to what we know or what we think we know. Um, I we, we do have to wrap up, but I wanna ask, cause there's one more really great question here about um, do either Ranan or Maya see any connection to how US citizens are reacting to images of BLM or the death of George Floyd this summer um, and how those images ultimately you know, influenced the election or, or maybe how, how we watch, how we watch the media that's fed to us um, in America, and and how that's influenced, been influenced in your career, how your interpretation of that's been influenced by the making of this film. Do you want to start, Maya? No, you, you can go ahead. You're you're muted, Rana. Ranan, you're, you're I'm muted. muted. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I see a big connection. I see a big connection. Um, I think the viewing booth happens with a viewer that's important for me and images that are important for me. But I think that ultimately the, the ideas that it explores, this is not a good film about uh, Palestine and Israel. I think it's not that. It's a film that really looks at things that are very applicable to other um, landscapes. And yes, the landscape of what, you know, what citizen filming has done for, is doing for social justice here. I mean, it can't be undermined. It's such a huge, I'm, if you ask me what's the single, most important, not not if you ask me, I mean, if you ask many people, what's the single most important piece of nonfiction media that was made this year, it's not going to be the films that will, you know, be competing for the Academy Award for Best Documentary, but it would be what that brave teenager did when she filmed um, George Floyd's murder. And, and she, so, um, and yes, I think um, how people negotiate images, how we all negotiate images that are uncomfortable for us is um, very related to that. And more than that, I think that my film could only ask, uh, our film could only ask a few questions. Um, it, the film does touch on, Maya sort of brings up the, relationship between fiction and nonfiction in the media environment today, which I think is very important when she sort of understands the connection to Fauda. Um, and um, another question that I think the film bring, brings up is the way that we are both, we would both like, uh, Ma Maya wants to view the film with, the view the images with, with context and I want her to view them with context, but the context is different. I want her to view it in the context of 53 years of nightly, every day, home invasions like this. Um, and she, she, the context that's very relevant for her is the fact that a father is filming his children rather than maybe sitting with them, right? So these are two different contexts that both belong to these, this image. Um, and we're sort of fighting about the boundaries of the frame. But another filmmaker who would do something like this in their own way um, and would explore um, uh, images in the US and audiences in the US would probably come out with other questions because there are so many more questions. 
that we have to ask ourselves about what is viewership of nonfiction image in this age or what is the viewer viewership of the pain of others um, in, in the time that we are now. And I'm, I'm sort of hoping that there may, I mean, my, my biggest hope for this film is that someone would say, I could do something like this. And these are the images that are important for me. And these are the people that are important for me. It might be climate, it might be racial justice, it might be immigration. Um, so I do, I definitely think that this is just, I, we open the door to something and I hope other people go there. Maya, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I just was gonna say that I definitely think like, you know, um, the, the, yeah, like Ronan said, the teenager who filmed uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, it's, it's there, I think there's a very big parallel, I think, um, to the images that I saw, you know, definitely. And maybe that's something that's happening in America, something that's happening more in America now, people are filming um, injustices and um, I mean, atrocities, like they're getting like, you know, um, they're getting proof of it. I think that's a really big deal. Um, now, am I gonna critique those? I hope not, but um, <laughs> you know, um, like I definitely think we can take them for what they are, you know, um, but, but I definitely do see a, uh, a parallel. Well, I, I think that's an interesting place to leave with, with a lot of room for thought um, as, as individuals have the power of filmmaking in a way in their hands, um, the power of a traditional documentary filmmaker shifts and, and interesting films like these um, are created. So thank you both so much, Ranan and Maya, for sharing your film with us and for being here with us tonight to discuss it. and. Thank you for having us. I, I just wish it was in that cinema in Brookline. Uh, we, we do but, too. We're, we're lucky maybe, to have the Coolidge Corner yeah. Theater and we miss it. <laughs> maybe in another time. Okay. Thank you. And thank you again to the Dockyard, who is our partner on tonight's screening. And tell your friends the film will be available to watch through November 15th um, at the Boston Jewish Film Festival. We hope to bring you back to Boston soon, Ranan, and you too, Maya. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good night.